Remain standing for a moment, if you would. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy. Everybody say, old but gold. This is the Old Testament. It says this in Deuteronomy chapter 16, speaking about a festival that today we're going to focus on because we are in the middle of a series called Summerfest. And God has been speaking to us as a church through these amazing festivals. And I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy about today's festival. It says, celebrate the festival of tabernacles for seven days after you've gathered the produce of your threshing floor and your wine press. Be joyful at your festival. You, your sons and daughters, your male and female servants, and the Levites, and the foreigners, and the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns for seven days. Celebrate the festival to the Lord your God at the place the Lord will choose, for the Lord will bless you. Come on, who wants a bit of blessing? The Bible says the Lord will bless you. It's a certainty. Well, that makes me feel really good. I don't know about you. The Lord will. Come on, who's declaring blessing over there tomorrow? The Lord will bless you, the Bible says. In all your harvest and in all your hard work, the work of your hands. And your joy will be complete. In other words... It may be hard, but joy is coming. Father God, I pray right now that you would speak to us. We thank you that by your Holy Spirit, we're able to hear your voice right now. We thank you that you are the God of the universe, and yet you're mindful, you know of, you care for the individual. And so every person in this room, God, I pray that you would speak to us right now as we open our hearts to you. Help us tune our ears to the sound of your voice so that we can go away changed. Save us from coming to church and going away the same. We want to be in your presence and leave having been transformed and continuing to be transformed so that we can in, in turn transform a city for your glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Before you sit down, give the person next to you a hug. Full frontal if you're confident. If it's not appropriate, just go side on. Just go side on if you're too cool. Why don't you thank the worship team through the medium of a round of applause. That's especially for you guys. Thank you so much. So, we're in the middle of a series called Summerfest. And like I said before, God has been speaking to us through some of the Old Testament festivals in the Bible. Now these festivals were annual festivals. They came round every year. And the reason why, or part of the reason why, I believe God was um, instigating these traditions is because God knows the power of a good habit. And so... What you have to think about to start with, if you do it often enough, if you can be disciplined enough to think about something often enough, eventually you'll do it without thinking. You'll know because you drove here today and most of you did not think for one second about what you were doing. You drove here without thinking. But when you learned to drive, every lesson was like intense and you were nervous and thinking about how you could get everything to work together at the same time and now you're doing it without thinking. It's the power of a habit. And these festivals in the Bible was God's way of helping teach the children of Israel and for us in 2017, uh, 17, last year and this year, guys, come on. For the church in 2018, uh, we can take it that, that God is speaking to us and teaching us some good habits. And so that's why over these last few weeks we've been looking at these different festivals so that we can make a disciplined, sort of um, intentional decision but then as we continue to do that on a regular basis, it actually becomes a habit, becomes part of our culture, becomes the way of life in our church. And wouldn't it be awesome if people came into our church and marveled at the way it is? Not so that we look great, but so that we can bring glory to God. That's what this is about. The church is here to point people towards Jesus. And so I want to talk to you today about this festival, the Festival of Tabernacles as I just read to you there. 
He says in Leviticus, another book in the Old Testament, about this festival, it says, live in temporary shelters for seven days. He says in Exodus chapter 23, celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops that you sow in the field. Every year, God would encourage the people to go out from where they lived and live in temporary shelters. And this festival was all about togetherness. Okay, togetherness or unity. How many people know when you spend a week in temporary shelters, in other words, a caravan, it produces a kind of togetherness that you cannot get when you stay at home? Come on, you're all packed in there. You're, you're kind of eating your main course off a plastic plate that you then rinse and then eat your dessert off. Come on, all you campers, you know what I'm talking about. You rinse it in the stream and then you have it. It's the same for everything. It's not about having china plates when you go camping because it's about being together. It doesn't matter that you need a trowel and some toilet roll and a walk into the woods. No, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> uh, we did. <laughs> There's something about the temporary ness, the sort of make do ness of camping that you really get away with because you are together. Now, I really believe God wants us in our church to cultivate to develop, to grow, to take responsibility for creating a culture or an environment where togetherness is able to work powerfully and do something in people's lives. You see, there's a difference between being in one place and being together. This message is called Together in One Place. You may have heard that phrase before. In the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit came and the day of Pentecost, the Bible says all the believers were together in one place, which suggests you can be in one place and not be together. You know that's possible because some of you have walked into a room where there were some people in one place, but they were absolutely not together. Come on now, you've walked into a room post a row, or you've interrupted a row, and although they don't have a row in front of you, you know they've had one. Because there's something in the atmosphere that makes you think, oh wow, there's not a lot of togetherness in this place. You can be in one place and not together, and the vision of what part of the vision of our church is not that we just gather people together in one place. Now we're believing for growth and increase and that this room will be full and our Chester campus will be full. And when we do church on tour starting next month, that those venues will be full and we'll all be in one place. However, the point is not being in one place. The point is togetherness. Cultivating a kind of togetherness that I really believe is powerful. We know because the Bible teaches us that people will um, look at the way we are with each other and through that they'll know whom we belong to. We'll bring glory to God by the way we honor each other. There's something important about it. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. God honors our togetherness with his presence. We always live in the presence of God. God is omnipresent. In other words, he's everywhere at once. But there's something powerful about us coming together. And in that moment, this sort of tangible sense, this almost reach out and touch it sense of the presence of God is, is facilitated by us being together. And I'm believing that people will come into our church They'll interact with the people of our church at work and at school and in the, in, the, in the schoolyard and all of those places. And the togetherness that we can embody, that we can carry with us, I believe is going to impact people and change our city. Am I on my own? No, because this is the vision of our church. And so you need to know something about me. I'm not really designed to be by myself. If you've ever, ever had a phone call from me between 5 and 6 o'clock, or 10 and 11 o'clock. It is that I want to talk to you, but it's also because I'm in the car on my own. And I'm driving home from work, or I'm driving home after some kind of service or meeting here at church, and there's like, you know, 30 whole minutes going down the East Lanks Road in the car by myself. And so normally when I ring people, especially those that I ring on a regular basis, they go, are you in the car? Are you on your way home? Because I just, I just don't like it. I'm not really designed to be that way. You can be in one place and not together, but you can also be in different places and together. You don't have to be in the same room, do you? My, my son, his name's Parker, he plays um, on, his, on his console, right, on his um, PlayStation at home. 
And while he's playing a game, he'll FaceTime his friend Nathan, Nathan Ralph, and Nathan will be playing a game on his console in their, in their house, on the other side of Manchester, and they're both on FaceTime together on an iPad. Now, they're not talking to each other. They're not even looking at each other. They're not even playing the same game at the same time, but they're just together. Because you don't have to be in the same place to be together. You know this because you've got friends and you've got family, you've got people, and you love a FaceTime chat and a phone call. And there's something about when you connect with someone, even if they're on the other side of the planet, you can just feel that sense of togetherness. I don't have to be in the room, but I can FaceTime Willow, my daughter, and she, there she is, and she loves it because we have a sense of togetherness. Come on, church, this is what God wants us to cultivate. This is not just for a chosen few or, or the ones that get lucky. This is something that we deserve to have because we're part of the family of God. And so this festival was all about that. It was about coming together. Forget, it doesn't matter that we're in tents. It doesn't matter that this is a temporary sort of make-do, makeshift kind of environment because the power of this is coming together. And I really believe God wants to speak to us today about the kind of togetherness and some of the things that they would have had to do, the questions they would have to ask to be able to um, make this disciplined habit a regular thing that they did every year and make it work. I reckon one of the first questions they would ask is, is, um, is this, is everyone here? You ever been on a journey, maybe you're traveling somewhere and you, maybe you change flights, you change, um, what's the word called? You don't fly all the way there because you, what? Connect, yes, you're getting a connecting flight. And so, uh, you know, kind of the journey is epic, but every now and again along the journey, especially if you're connected to another flight, you've got to check everyone's here because you don't want to lose anyone on the way. And I reckon because of the way this verse is written, it makes me, it seems to me like God is saying, listen, everyone's included. Everyone's included. If we're going to create a sense of togetherness in our church, we have to recognize that everybody is included. Everybody is invited. There's nothing you have to do, nothing you have to say, no level you have to achieve. You are included. God says this, he says, um, you, your sons, your daughters, your servants, the Levites, the foreigners, the fatherless, the widows. In other words, don't leave anyone out. Listen, you need to know about our church. And any church where Jesus is at the center, on the throne, in the middle, is that everyone's included. It doesn't matter whether you're young or old, you're included. It's my birthday today. I am 42. I don't know if that means I'm young or old. All of the people over 40 said, young. All of the people under 40 said, old. But listen, young or old, you're included. Cool or nerd? Included. Any nerds in the house? Yeah, if you don't have your hand up, all your mates think you're a nerd. Just so you know. Cool or nerd, you're included. Confident or shy, you're included. Black or white, you're included. Wealthy or poor, you're included. Come on, church, good or bad even, you are included. <laughs> think about that for a moment. Good or bad, you're invited to the house of God. The reason why is because you don't get clean before you get in the shower. Unless you've got a new bathroom. And it lasts for about six weeks. Or you move into your first house like we did when we first got married. Our bathroom, pink. Come on, who remembers the pink bathroom suites when they were cool? Yes, all the people who were in the old bracket. <laughs> Not you, of course. When we first got married, we had a horrendous pink bathroom. But it was our first house, it was new and it was shiny. And so when I used to play football... Yes, I know. To play football on a Saturday morning, I would come home full of mud, and Zoe would go, point me out to the backyard, and she would hose me down with a hose pipe to get all the mud off before I got into the shower. Now, that didn't last very long because, uh, well, because I'm the man of the house, and I just told her. No, I didn't. I, I didn't. <laughs> You're laughing because you know I didn't do that. Zoe is like Napoleon, small but powerful. But everybody knows, you don't get clean before you get in the shower. You get in the shower because you need to get clean. And you need to know this about our church. You don't have to be good to come to the house of God. You don't have to be perfect or, or even have you know, some kind of good reputation. 
dirty people welcome in the house of God. And that's not because we're just kind of into compromise and anyone can do what they want. It's because we're so confident in the power of the presence of God and the grace of God that we know the longer you stay here, the cleaner, in inverted commas, the more like Jesus you have the potential to come. So they would have said, right, is everyone here? Have we forgot anyone? All right, we're all in. Everyone's in the tent. Everyone's here. We've got our sleeping bags. And I reckon the next thing they would do is start to reminisce. It's a bit like when you go on holiday, you've had a day at the beach, you've had your tea, you kind of sat out under the stars, you start thinking about the last holiday that you had or the year that you've had and maybe it's a bit like New Year's Eve, you know, when you kind of get everyone together, there's a sense of remembering that just sort of flows from the sense of togetherness and they would sit there and they would think about the past and they would think about the story and they would think about what's happened to get them to this point and they would laugh and they would cry and they would... You know, they'd be doubled over remembering when you sat in a deck chair and you fell right through it or, I don't know, whatever the funny story might be, you would laugh about it. And I reckon for us in our togetherness, trying to cultivate this sense of togetherness in our church, God wants some people in this room this afternoon to know that your story matters. Your story matters. And the reason why I know your story matters is because Jesus has scars. Think about that for a moment. Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, just incredible Son of God has scars. The Bible says that Jesus stepped out of heaven, became a man, which in itself was like a a wound, and took on the form of of a man and lived as a man, fully man, fully God. Get your head around that. But he lived this perfect life, this sinless life, didn't sin at all. And yet there came a point in his life when he took the punishment. He was crucified on the cross for our sin. Come on, he made a way to the Father God. This, amazing, this is like the central piece in the, in the jigsaw. This is the main thing about our faith is that Jesus died on the cross. And I'm free and you're free because Jesus did that. Well, the Bible teaches us that when he died, he, three days later, he rose from the dead. And that's what makes him different to anyone else that might have died for their, kind of what they said or what they believed. This was different because Jesus came back to life. But the Bible tells us that when he came back to life, let me read it to you. There was something different about him. John chapter 20, verse 19 says this. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together... With the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and he said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. In other words, he showed them his scars. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. A bit later in the same chapter, verse 26, it says a week later, his disciples were in in the house again. And this time Thomas was with them because he was absent the first time. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and he, saw, and he said, peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hand, reach your hand and put it in my side. In other words, look at my scars and stop doubting and believe. Why, when Jesus came back from the dead, resurrected, having defeated death and defeated sickness and made a way to heaven, why, why would the scars not be removed? The reason why I believe, and this is the word of the Lord for us today, and someone in this room needs to hear this, is is because sometimes the things we want God to remove, he wants to redeem. I've never met a Christian who, when when, when they said yes to Jesus, that Jesus appeared like Dr. Emmett Brown from Back to the Future in a DeLorean. Like Jesus, wheel spins in, lifts up the wing door and says, come on, now you're a person of faith. We're going to go back to the past and we're going to undo all the stuff that's happened to you to this point. That's never happened to me. It's never happened to anyone I know. But what has happened to me, and I know so many stories of of other people, is that when we met Jesus, somehow the things that had happened until that point, even the ones that were bad, even the ones that might hold us back, they somehow took on a new meaning. Whether it was a different way of looking at it, whether or not Jesus just helped us forgive, or whatever it might be, God wants to redeem the things that we sometimes want him to remove. 
Sometimes we bring that removal mentality into our, like our today. We say, God, get me out of this situation. Remove this situation from me. Sometimes we might say, God, remove this marriage from me. It's not working. Well, I've got a word for you today. God wants to redeem your marriage. God, get me out of this situation. I'm just really struggling with my kids. I just, I just want to give up and start again. Just do, just do a new life. Listen, God wants to redeem the relationship with your kids. Jesus wants your kids in the house of God. God wants to redeem. In other words, give new meaning. This is what the re- redemption means in the dictionary. It says the action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. The action of gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt to compensate for the faults or bad aspects of. In other words, it might have meant bad. It might have started off on the negative, but God wants to redeem, give new meaning to that thing. And I'm believing in the redemptive power, the redeeming power of the presence of God for your life. Jesus has scars. The Bible says this in Revelation chapter 5. This is a, a, a vision of heaven. It says, I looked and I saw a lamb, capital L. In other words, Jesus, I saw a lamb and on the lamb were wounds that had once caused his death. In the, in the NIV it says, with the appearance of being slain. In other words, Jesus has scars. And I know there's people in the room this afternoon and you've got scars too. Some of you got physical scars, some of you got emotional scars, you've been through some stuff, but I just believe right now, today, in this moment, God wants to begin a a redemptive work, a redeeming work, even in that area, that right now you just cannot imagine how that, anything good could come from that. I know this is true because of a story that's close to my own life. I want to share with you Stan's story, the story of Stan. This is Stan. Stan is my father-in-law. And so down there on the floor there, that's Zoe. Put the other one on if you can. There you go. There's Zoe on the left in a home knit cardigan. Come on now. And a home haircut as well by the look of it. In Jesus' name. Could you just put the other one back on because I want Zoe just to take a picture of Jessica, that's Zoe's sister on the right there. If you could just take a picture of that and just send it to your sister and say, you're in a bikini on a 40-foot LED wall in front of 500 people, that'd be great. (laughs) I'm sure she'll be thrilled and now put the other one back on because we don't want to look at that. This is Stan. Now, I've never met Stan because when I met Zoe, Stan had already passed away. But I want to tell you the story because when Zoe was in year six, we didn't call it year six then, we called it top of primary school. It was called year six now. So when she was in year six, Stan got cancer and he got, he got seriously ill. And for five years, they fought this cancer. And in that time, Zoe and her sister Jess and her mom Sue and Stan, none of them were Christians. They didn't know God. They didn't, you know, they didn't go to church. And so you can imagine this was just like a, a, you know, a terrible thing for them to go through. And Zoe's mom, her name's Sue, and she's just an absolutely beautiful human being. I'm telling you now, I, I hope you meet her one day because she's just absolutely awesome. Um, but she was desperate because Stan, you know, her husband was dying, the girl's dad, he was dying, it was bad. And so she was trying everything, you know, she was praying to Elvis, Buddha, like anyone who's listening. She was just desperate. And she was a dinner lady, Sue, she was a dinner lady in a school, Zoe's school, actually, which is like majorly embarrassing. Imagine if your mum's a dinner lady. Oh, well, bless the Lord. She's a dinner lady. And, um, and one day there was a... Uh, like a a temporary, like a supply almost dinner lady that came in, did three days work at the school. She was a Christian. Her name was Denise Green. And thank you, Jesus, for Denise Green because she told Sue about Jesus and Sue just said, listen, I'll try anything. Stan's dying. I don't know what to do. And so she went along to church with Denise Green and she went to church. She encountered the love of God, completely changed how she looked at everything. She said yes to Jesus. She started this journey of faith hope started to rise, faith started to rise, there was a confidence that God had them as a family, before long Zoe started going to church and she became a Christian, before long Jessica went to church and she became a Christian and it took a little while but eventually Stan went to church and he became a Christian and it was this amazing story of how God just intervened in that family tree and they found God but eventually 
five years after fighting cancer, it got to the point where Zoe and Jess and her mom and Stan kind of accepted that maybe Stan's healing was going to come in heaven. Maybe the healing that they were believing for was on its way, but it wasn't going to take the form that they hoped, which is that he would be well with them. But in actual fact, that he would go to heaven and he would be well and he would be running around and laughing and dancing and have his full restoration, full healing in heaven. And so what happened was Stan said, I don't want any more treatment. And so they sent him home from hospital. He had a hospital bed in their house. And so they were given some, you know, some coaching, some instructions. The nurse would come, but more often than not, it would be Jess and, and Zoe and, uh, and her mom kind of, you know, taking care of everything. And what happened was one day, um, Zoe's dog, Judy, pulled the curtains down in the front room. And uh, I've seen the pictures of them curtains. They needed to come down. Don't, don't you worry about it. And so Zoe's mum said, listen, Zoe, I'm going to leave you with your dad. You know what to do. Everything's fine. I'm not going to be long. I'm going to go out and buy some new curtains. And she went off, I would imagine, to Bolton Market to buy some new curtains. And, um, and while she was out, Stan had some kind of seizure, some kind of episode. And so Zoe, you know, she's in year 10. She's 14 years old. She's freaking out. She doesn't know what to do. Kind of runs over to the bed, remembers, oh yeah, I remember what they told us to do. We have to make sure he doesn't choke on his tongue. And so she put her thumb in his mouth to, you know, as they'd instructed her so that he didn't choke. And he bit her thumb, broke the skin. She was like, ow, kind of backed off, didn't know what to do. And Stan died. So his mum came home. Obviously, it's a tragic, like major tragedy. Everybody's sad. Zoe, this is like classic Zoe, just went to school the next day, didn't tell anyone. Just kind of got on with it, went and did maths and, and just got on with it. But for a while, that scar on her thumb represented sad. It represented questions like, why me? It represented pain. It represented hurt. It represented, how are we going to move past this? What does the future even look like without my dad? But I've got to tell you something amazing. I didn't meet Zoe until she was 19, and when I met her, she wasn't doing any of that. She wasn't sad. She wasn't um, uh, kind of suffering the, the tr traumatic effects of this trauma. Instead, she was strong. She was confident. She was beautiful. She was awesome. And what had happened was, over time, and I've got to be honest with you, it was over time, over time of walking with Jesus, loving God, being able to be healed by God. So we had to become really strong because her mum got sick after that, as you can imagine. And she would cook and clean and do all that and look after her sister. But I'm telling you now, she is a strong, fiercely independent, beautiful individual. So much so that now that scar doesn't mean what it used to mean. To the point when, when our children were born, Zoe's got a tattoo on her wrist. Three stars, four stars. How many is there of us? There's four, isn't there? There was three at the time. A big one for me, because I am a star. And two little ones for our boys. But when Willow was born, she said, I'm going to get another tattoo. And we talked for a while about having this tattoo on her thumb, not to cover the scar, but actually to celebrate the scar. Because God has done something in her life. He has redeemed what was, what was painful, and now it means Thank you, Jesus, that I made it. Now it means I'm strong. Now it means there's hope. Now it means someone else can suffer and get through. Olu, come and, come and help me, bro, as soon as you can. We're going to pray because I know there's people in the room and you've got scars, and I want to give you an opportunity to respond to God. Because... Not only do I, I, I feel that God wants to redeem, give new meaning to things that you may have been through or feelings you may have or maybe even something you're going through right now, but I believe there's something even beyond that. Because what Zoe does now, and if there will be many people that know what I'm talking about because there will be many people in the room that this affects you personally, is that once, twice, three times, four times a week sometimes, Zoe will sit down with people. She'll have one-to-one. -one. She'll pray with them. She'll encourage them. She'll um, mentor them in some way. 
And although she's not going to sit there and go, look at this scar, do you know what it means? It means my dad died, but I'm strong now. No, she doesn't do any of that. She doesn't refer to it. In fact, it probably means more to me than it does Zoe. To me, this is like, oh my gosh, this amazing story of this scar. Zoe's like, she's just so strong and determined to move forward. But she's now able to look someone in the eye and she's able to say, you know what? I know you feel pain right now, but it won't last forever because you can come out the other side. Let me pray for you. Let me encourage you. The Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 53. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And then it ends with this. It says, and by his stripes, in other words, by his scars, we are healed. The message puts it this way. We are bru- through his bruises, we are healed. What that tells me is behind one person's scars could be another person's healing. And although Zoe has a scar on her thumb, we believe every time she goes and meets with someone and talks to them and has coffee and is that there's healing. And she knows it because the scar tells her so. It's redeemed. It means something different. And I really believe that not only is God going to restore to you, going to redeem, going to give new meaning to some of the things that you've been through, He's even going to take you beyond that to the point, because right now you're thinking, I don't know if I can have joy in this, what I'm going through. I don't know if there's any joy, if there's any light at the end of the tunnel. There is, but even beyond that, there's going to come a moment, I'm prophesying now, I'm prophesying now to people who've got scars and saying that one day, not only will you have joy, but also there'll be enough of that joy to overflow and actually bring joy to another person. That's what I believe. And right now you can't imagine it. Right now you're like, what? I can barely just, I can barely walk with this thing that causes me so much pain. I don't know. I'm like a minus 10. Well, God's going to restore and it will be step by step. It's not a magic wand come forward, we'll pray for you, and when you leave, everything will be sorted, because it's not a time machine. But over time, it doesn't have to be a long time, but over time, walking with Jesus, and with the sense of togetherness that you find in the house of God, I believe we can walk to a place, not just of restoration, but of actual overflow, so that we can actually, as a church, look back at what we've been through, and say to someone who's walking through something similar, you know what, it's going to be all right. So I want everyone to stand to your feet. Listen, you know what I think is, is, a, is a key ingredient to healing, to becoming free, to moving forward. And it's part of this festival was not just coming together, not just remembering, but it was actually praising. They came together and they thanked God for the work that they'd done, the fruit that he'd brought into their life because of that work. And there's something about Zoe's story and Stan's story that's littered with praise. It is literally littered with praise. And I believe saying thank you, having a grateful heart, a heart of gratitude, can be like a, like a catalyst. Like something that when you feel like you're just stuck in the mud and the wheels are going round and nothing's happening, all you need to do is get some traction. And I, I think gratitude does that. Times where you're like, I can't, I, I just don't know what to do. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make a disciplined decision to thank God. And something will happen. Something shifts. It's not a magic, it's not a magic spell. It's not, it's, not, it's not medicine in the sense of take this pill and everything will be all right. But it just gets things moving. It gets your heart out of position and into a different position. It gets your eyes lifted. You start to look at things and think about things in a different way. And so everybody that's responded and all those that are responding in their hearts right now, what we're going to do now is we're going to just turn our hearts towards gratitude. We're going to thank God. We're going to lift him up. For some of you, you're going to have to dig deep. Over these next few days and weeks and months, there's going to be days when you're like, I can't think of anything to thank God for. And so what you're going to do is you're going to open the book. You're going to read what the book says. You're going to say, thank you for the truth of your word. And it's going to be a traction moment. It's going to be a catalyst moment. 
And we're going to keep doing it out of discipline until we do it without thinking. And before you know it, you'll be looking back going, wow, I was just praying with Danny and Mo. I just prophesied there's going to be a day coming where you look back and go, how far have we come? You didn't even realize all you've been doing is just thanking God, thanking God, thanking God, thanking God. I want to prophesy one last time. And it's a theme that's found in the Bible. But I want to prophesy that which someone intended for harm, God is going to redeem, and it's actually going to have the opposite effect. You're going to find yourself in situations where you will know what to do. And perhaps you wouldn't have known what to do if you hadn't been through what you went through, but God is going to use that which someone else meant for harm so that you will know what to do, what to say, you'll keep your head, you'll remain calm, you'll be confident, you'll be a tower of strength when others are, 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 are wilting. And it's because of the grace of God. Come on, every day this week, I want you to find something to thank God for. We, 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 we come together, we remember what he's done, we thank him, and we can now look forward. Come on, give God some praise. You know, I really just want to give an opportunity for people in church today to respond to God for the first time. It's been amazing seeing what God has been doing, not just down the front here, but all across the room as you've been allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you. But I know in a church like ours, there's always people who've not yet started this journey that we call faith. They've not said yes to Jesus. They don't know God. I'm not talking about going to church or even reading your Bible or even believing that God exists. I'm talking about knowing God. There's a difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. You might know about a celebrity, but you don't know them. And every person that you've seen on the platform and many, many people in our church don't just know about God, but we're on a journey of discovery in, in knowing who God is. It's called faith, it's called being a Christian, it's called being a disciple, it's called being a believer. And it's as simple to access as just saying one prayer. This prayer is simple, but it's powerful. And I want to give you the opportunity because if we just come together and, and don't create this moment, I think we've missed one of the most important things that we do, if not the, the most important. We want to say this prayer together. It's just a few lines, but we're believing it's ahead of a lifetime of conversation between you and the King of Kings. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 49, it says, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. When Jesus looks at the scars on his hands, he sees your name. If your name's engraved on the palm of his hand and the scars are in his hands, then when he looks at the scars, he sees your name. He went to the cross for you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I want to pray. It's a salvation prayer. It's a simple prayer, like I said. We're going to do it line by line, but I just want to know who I'm including. We're going to give you a Bible. We're going to uh, pray with you if that's what you want. We want to start you off on this journey called faith. So with every eye closed, every head bowed, no one looking around just in this moment, if you want me to include you in this prayer, you don't have to come out. I'm just going to say it from here. We're all going to say it together, actually. But if you want to be included in this prayer, then I want you to do something. I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand right now if you're saying yes to Jesus. I can see you at the back, fantastic over there. Someone else, yeah, I can see you. Someone else saying yes to Jesus over here as well on this side. I can see you, fantastic too over there. Yeah, I can see you down there as well, two in the middle there sitting down. I can see you saying yes to Jesus. Maybe it's not for the first time. Maybe you already did this once, but you know in your heart you've walked away from God. I can see you over there, fantastic. But you're coming back to him today. I can see you at the front. Good job. Anyone else saying yes to Jesus? I can see you at the back. Good job, mate. All right, we're going to pray this prayer together. We're all going to say it. But if you raised your hand out, I really want you to say this with everything you've got. Dear Lord Jesus, 
I believe you are real. I can see now that you love me. I know I'm not perfect and I've made some mistakes, but right now I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you took my place when you gave your life for me, but that you rose from the dead. So I want to stop living my way and invite you into my life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. From now on, my life is yours. And I want to live for you. Amen. Come on, church. Why don't you just give those people some encouragement as they have made this great decision.